Good morning. My name's Paula Williams, and I'm one of the board members at QCF, and we had the pleasure in this past year of seeking out new leadership for our organization. And we decided to go a different direction from many other organizations, most other organizations and corporations in the United States. One of our concerns is that most leadership in the US is vertical and patriarchal. It comes out of systems that are top down, that have one person who's in charge of other people. And yet when we take a look at God in God's self, there are three in one. And so we decided to move toward a Trinitarian inspired model that we've seen work in a number of churches that allows us then to have kinds of people in leadership who might not normally find themselves in a CEO position. People who have broader kinds of gifts and the kinds of gifts that can work together well. And we've discovered as we've looked around the country at other organizations that have done the same that it tends to work really well if you have a few things. You've got to have people that have a very high EQ, emotional equivalence. They have to have a very high relational capacity, which means they've got to be really mature people. Then we've got to have clear job descriptions. So after a very long search, we've come to our position where we have three members of our executive leadership team. No one of these three people is actually in charge. The entire ELT is in charge. So Bukola Landis Aina is our Director of Communications and Internal Logic. Isaac Archuleta is our Director or exec Executive Director of um, <laughs> Spiritual and Relational Formation. Just talk amongst yourselves while I read. <laughs> And Sam Locke is our Director of Development and Sustainability. So, um, Bukola, you know, you come to this with a degree from MIT and a law degree from NYU, so you really don't come particularly credentialed. <laughs> you know, but we decided to hire you anyway. Um, what is it that uniquely qualified you for this position? So as a Nigerian American, uh, first generation, my focus was engineering. <laughs> that, was, that was really pressed upon me, that was important, um, and law as well. But as I was in undergraduate school, I was encouraged to pick a humanities concentration and I immediately gravitated towards women's studies. And so what that did was I was focusing on how women and gender and society function. And, and I was learning one way in school, and then on the other hand, I was learning from my Bible studies at church and in conservative spaces, a completely separate thing about gender and society and roles. And so what that did is created me, created in me a dissonance that kind of was stirred up and it just kind of sat there. And it wasn't until I came out at 29, many, many years later, that I was like, oh, that dissonance that was there, I'm gonna have to deal with that. And so, because that was there, it really helped to orient me. It wasn't like I was learning for the first time that everything I was learning, that there might be something to reconcile there. And so that, that certainly helped me. And so when I was disfellowshipped from my conservative church and um, found an affirming space, I was ordained as a deacon. Um, my gifts were affirmed, my identity were affirmed. And so that has helped me. And then it helps that I'm a wife, a mom, and I play women's tackle football. <laughs> and so, Multitasking <laughs> has been something I've had to learn as well as teamwork, and so that makes this possible. You know, it's kind of funny that you say that because I think most of us here have done women's tackle football. <laughs> <laughs> so Bukola, why this? Why QCF specifically? Yeah. So I'm here because I love this organization. 
And I love that it always has been and always will be about creating space for disagreement, allowing us to embrace our differences and come together. And so that's, that's what it's always been about for me. So it's about expanding the tent so that more and more people can come inside because the kingdom of God is so much broader than anything that we can see, anything that we can even fathom. And so we've got to do that difficult ministry work of creating those bridges so that we can all be within this tent, so that we can love one another within this tent, so that we can remain different and be in this tent, and that we can disagree and have that safety to continue to disagree without challenging anyone's belonging under this tent. So Jonathan Haidt. <laughs> Uh, Jonathan Hyde in his brilliant book, The Righteous Mind, that talks so much about our polarization in America. He talks about the importance of us as uh, humans not being primarily rational creatures, but by being primarily intuitive creatures, that we make our decisions intuitively, and then we, we create rational decisions to go with those. But he says we take in no new information unless it comes to us in a non-threatening way. So how can we then, as an organization, be the kind of organization that helps people take in new information in ways that might actually change their perspectives on things? Right. Well, as an organization, we have to focus on our missional goals, which are create deep community, allow there to be an inspiration for growth, spiritual, personal growth, and then also to always be seeking justice relational justice specifically. And so these are the things that center us, these are the things that are the way forward, and what that means on a practical level is that we're always gonna be searching for ways to make us all comfortable with being the other in the room. So whether it's, there's a side A speaker and you may be side B. There's a side B speaker and you be may be side A, and so, and vice versa. And so there could be a cis speaker and you may be trans and there could be a trans speaker, and you may be cis. So uplifting all these different identities and perspectives so that we'll all have that feeling of being the other um, for, um, for that conversation. And so the more that we can learn that, the more that we can become comfortable with that, then maybe, just maybe, we'll build up that muscle and be able to recognize what it is to be the other in the room or in a conversation, and maybe we'll be more gentle with someone when we're not the other, when we're in the majority and we see someone being othered, we can have that gentleness, have a grace-minded approach to how to dialogue, how to disagree, and maybe stick up for them, even if you feel like there's something that they're saying could be harmful to you or to someone like you. So Sam, you come to us from a little bit different background than most of us. A lot of us are coming out of an evangelical background, and we tend to project onto others our own experience of coming out. Yours is not the same as it was for a lot of us. Talk to us about that. Yeah, that's true. I came out when I was 30 years old. I was married to a woman, happily married even, two wonderful kids that uh, are the apple of my eye. but. Uh, I had structured this life of expectations that no one else had placed on me. I can't point to a church being unwelcoming. I can't point to a family that had issues with issues of uh, sexuality generally. It was the system I had set up for myself that as it began to deconstruct, I just couldn't handle the burden anymore. And so at that point in my life, I had to deal with what that was. And as I came out, I discovered this whole new life and world where I'm able to be emotionally vulnerable for the first time, where I've had my heart broken for the first time, where I can actually live through all of the emotions that we live through uh, as one another each day. So Sam, you have an extensive background in nonprofit leadership and in nonprofit fundraising. That's not enough being a true Renaissance person. You also desire to become ordained, and you're almost done with your Master of Divinity degree, which is quite the slog. Talk to us about that call to ordination. One more semester, two more classes, and we are done. 
I, I spent the bulk of my career working at the national headquarters of the Presbyterian Church USA, managing uh, many of their fundraising programs for social justice ministries. And in that role, I got the chance to meet a lot of amazing people around the world doing God's work in so many different ways. And in that process, I really discovered that the work I was doing was ministry also. You can look at fundraising and development as a task that you just have to do that has to be completed to sustain an organization, or you can look at it as a welcome or an invitation to participate in the work that God is doing around the world. And so I really felt a ministry calling to the work that I was already doing, and it's been transformational to be able to apply a lot of the things that you learn in a divinity program uh, to the uh, uh, the faith community generally, and specifically the work of fundraising, which you don't always often associate together. So you also come from a mainline Protestant background. For those of you who don't know exactly what that means, just think of all the dying denominations. Uh, the United Church of Christ, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, uh, the Disciples of Christ. I'm sorry, but all the statistics show between 17 and 22 years, they're not all doing that great. And so one of the reasons that we've really got to be focused on creating new churches that will be extremely healthy. I think that's one of the things that we're called to do in the process. And those of you coming out of the mainline background, um, you can pummel me in the back <laughs> as soon as we're done with this section. But you come out of that background, that circumstance. So when we talk about side A or side B, those of us from an evangelical background are not, um, that's not language that has much meaning to you. So talk to us about what it's been like coming into that setting and how we can, in fact, serve those uh, denominations so they do become stronger and stronger. Sure, I think that's absolutely right. I consider myself a church insider, like many of you. I've worked in the church my whole life, either professionally or as a volunteer. I am doing the education process to become an ordained minister. And worked within the LGBT movement within the church, but I didn't know what side A or side B meant until I started working for this organization. Those were words that carried no meaning for me. Uh, and there's a double-edged sword there, right? There is an opportunity to have tough conversations that the evangelical church has done well. What we like to do in the mainline WASP communities is do nothing and talk, do nothing to talk about these things, right? Silence is better than, than working through these things. So we have a lot to learn from that perspective. And I think there is also uh, something the evangelical community, our community can learn from welcoming a broader Christian community into the conversation. So whether uh, you're side A or side B or something completely different, not represented in those phrases at all, our community should be a group that invites the whole body of God uh, into its, uh, its midst. And I, I, I think that these communities can just learn so much from each other with the different backgrounds that they have that will just make us stronger as an organization and stronger as a community. So Isaac, how'd you get here? <laughs> Took me a little while. Um, I say that because when I was 12 years old, um, I was, I was praying at the altar in my father's um, Assemblies of God Church. And I just remember with, with so much motivation saying, God, I want to give you my life to accomplish great things. And then when I was in seminary, we were learning about human development and how this little uh, fetus in utero would grow and what would be affected. And as I was coming out to myself, I was so angry with God, almost as though God had set me up. And I was furious. I remember driving home one day, just bawling and screaming at God. I was studying counseling, and I was trying to reconcile what I was learning in my classes with what I was feeling and knowing about myself and, and what my father had preached my entire life. And as I stepped into being a psychotherapist, I, I began listening to the hearts and minds of people just like me coming out, parents of children coming out, and listening to the stories over and over and over again while I was reflecting on that 12-year-old memory. I knew that I wanted the work that I was going to do to be a message that you matter. 
I wanted to create a life that would be giving back. I discovered that God loves us unconditionally, and that was a new sensation for me. Um, and so here at Q, I love that I get to work um, with this community. It's, it's my dream. We hear a lot of talk today about equality and equity. There's a difference between the two. Talk to us about that. There's a very big difference between the two. I like to think of it as a table. Equality says that you belong at the table. You have an equal space. You get the same portion of food. Uh, you're, you're welcome at this table. You are equal. When we're just equal, though, we don't get to participate into the food. We don't get to add our own spices. We don't get to participate in the recipe. Equity, however, means that we get to add our own spices to the food, that we get to influence what happens, what's enjoyed, what's tasted, what's experienced. And at Q Christian Fellowship, we're not just going for equality, we're going for equity. We want to maintain flexible. We want to be influenced by every single one of you, adding your own spices to who we are. Talk to us about our volunteers here at QCF. Woo, I love y'all. <laughs> yes, please. Since its beginning, Q Christian has stood on the shoulders of its volunteers. This organization would not be here without its volunteers. Along the way, uh, we lost sight of thanking our volunteers, of showing gratitude, of creating a culture of uh, respect. A while back, a couple months ago, a brave um, group of four approached the ELT with their frustration and their anger. And we took that very seriously. It was a, it was a very serious learning moment for me uh, to, and a re revelation of how we needed to shift and pivot and really create a culture of gratitude. Um, so we've created some volunteer tiers that outline how we compensate our volunteers. And as we shore up all of our resources, we are um, keeping in mind first and foremost that we have to thank the people who make this whole thing a success. Sam, you're responsible for overseeing our, yes, I think that's, yes. You're responsible for overseeing the finances of QCF. Talk to us a little bit about how all that's going. The easiest answer is that we are doing well financially. Uh, one of the toughest things to build as a fundraiser, as a development officer, is a vibrant monthly giving program where people commit to give the same amount every month for an extended period of time. Q Christian has one of the strongest monthly giving programs I've seen in my 15 years of fundraising, and that is an incredible uh, achievement that the organization has built and sustained over time. And to grow and to do the things that we want to do as we move forward as an organization, we have to work a little harder still. We want to keep growing that and expand and invite even more folks to participate. We'll invite you to participate tomorrow in that process. We need to do a better job of building partnerships, particularly with national grant making organizations uh, that want to partner with us in both the secular and wider faith-based communities to do our work. And we have to uh, look at the events we hold as an organization and make sure that they are sustainable, that we are correctly pricing things, that we are uh, making sure that we're actually uh, reflecting the true cost of the, the programming that we do on behalf of all of you. So does conference pay for itself through registrations? No. The, the IRS sets forth clear uh, guidelines for nonprofits on what's counted as event revenue. And under those guidelines, the conference rarely makes money. Uh, it's subsidized by uh, those monthly uh, donations that we mentioned and are incredibly grateful for. But the long history of the conference has been that it's not been a revenue generator. We don't necessarily want it to be something that creates profit, but we do want it to be something that is sustainable, that at the very least 
breaks even. So as we look at conference programming and the things we do, that's going to be at the forefront of our mind to make sure that those gifts that come in from other ways cannot just go to subsidize other things that you see today, but also expand our programming and reach to the broader, the broader world. What resources are we developing right now, Isaac? I'm very, very excited about what we're developing. Um, I've been dreaming about it for a very, very long time, so I'm excited um, for what we're creating. We are creating four what I'm calling pillar resources, and pillar because I want them to hold up the ministerial efforts that we're creating here. Um, so we are creating um, the Great Communion, which is already live on the website. It has two sections. The first section is a repository of stories. So we're collecting stories um, from, from various members of our community so that we can learn and journey alongside of one another side by side. Um, these stories are very intentional because we want them to live as a resource for people who are coming out, for parents who are just learning of their children's identities. Uh, we want there to be a way for people to have access on their journey towards self-acceptance and healthy relationships. We're also creating resources for the trans community, for clergy who are wanting to create safe spaces for our community, um, and also for parents. Uh, we are also creating something I'm calling the spiritual formation team. So we're gathering thought leaders, MDivs, and natural leaders from the community to create curriculum that will be used at regional um, Bible studies and small groups across the country. Um, and then the thing that I'm really excited about is we're going to create um, sm uh, small groups online, if you will, so people in rural countries who don't have access to the greater um, LGBTQIA community can actually have a small group online um, so that they get access to, to this community wherever they are. What are our priorities over the next 12 months, Bukola? So we want to be able to create opportunities to connect throughout the year. So we can't subsist on conference alone. And so it's got to be about, you know, Sam saying, you know, we've got to raise money so that we can afford other programming and create these resources that Isaac's talking about. And so building up that infrastructure has to be a major focus. Um, the other thing that we really want to focus on is communicating better with the community. We are, there's a lot of work being done at the board level. There's a lot of work being done on the leadership, and there's a lot of work being done on staff. Um, we're still a staff of three and a half, though, because all of us are part-time and we have two full-time staff workers. So we've got to build the team. We've got to build um, infrastructure again. Um, but we've got to work on being able to communicate better out what the work that's going on internally out towards the whole community. So on his very last day of public ministry, the last time he ever spoke to crowds at large, Jesus was asked one final question. And his answer to that question silenced the crowd and changed everything. He said, which were the greatest of the laws? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as you love your own self. But the phrase he added to it that they weren't prepared for was the phrase on this are all the law and the prophets based. Being a follower of Jesus is actually pretty simple. Not easy, but it's simple. It's about three things. Loving God, loving neighbor, loving self. How can we do that better at QCF? That's a good question. So as we continue to do this work, um, we realize that it's difficult stuff we're being asked to do. Um, we're disagreeing on issues of identity. We're disagreeing on issues of faith and entire world views. And so we have to recognize that it's going to be difficult. And But for Jesus, it's not possible. And so as we continue to stretch ourselves and grow, we are you know, going to have to lean into that. We're going to have to get used to the idea that we're going to bump up against each other. Like, the more you get close to someone who's different from you, 
you have to expect that there are going to be those flare-ups, there are going to be those bumps and bruises. And I think the goal is to, for us to ask ourselves in those situations, how do we model Christ in this situation, in this disagreement, in this um, space? And so as we do that more, I think we have to build up the muscle of being able to resist, to be resilient um, for those bumps and bruises. Yeah, kind of like having to watch out for board members who say pejorative things about mainline denominations. <laughs> yeah, that would, that would be true. <laughs> so, Sam, love God, love neighbor, love self. How do we do that? The thing that I've fallen in love with the most about my reformed faith tradition uh, is the belief that God's love is absolutely universal and that God's grace is irresistible. To me, that means to one another, and I think maybe even more importantly, that means giving ourselves the freedom to make mistakes, to try things, to, to say things and take them back, Paula. <laughs> I think I'm gonna be hearing about this. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, and to give each other the space to have those conversations, to show love for one another, but also to forgive ourselves and to show grace to ourselves as we are in these tough spots coming together as a community of God in love. Isaac, you love so well. It's just kind of who you are. So how it's can fun. we love ourselves better? It's so much a part of the DNA of what you do in mm. your work with the IM clinic and your private practice and here with QCF. Yeah, thank you for that compliment, by the way. Um, I told myself I wouldn't say um, and I'm, here I am umming my way through this. <laughs> <clears throat> love your neighbor as you love yourself. What happens if we don't love ourselves very well? When we are, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you on a little bit of a journey here. When, when we grow up in the closet, we're experiencing something that I call the illusion of control. I have this illusion that I can control how you feel. I have this illusion that I can control how you value me, how you appraise me. So if I create this facade that's spectacular enough I believe that I'm keeping you happy with who I am. But what this facade does is it also very subconsciously teaches me that I can earn value. The more spectacular my facade, the more valuable I am. And if I drop my facade, I'm no longer valuable. When we live out of this posture, we can't really love ourselves well because we're so focused on what our facade looks like. When I think of God, though, and as I look at this room, one of the things that I've discovered in my own coming out process and, and really feeling truly loved by those around me is that we are all inherently valuable. There's nothing I can do. I, can, I cannot perform my way into being more valuable. And I cannot sin my way or mistake my way into watching my value plummet. It is fixed. It is permanent. It is stable. It is cemented. It will never move. And this is why I say come out of that closet, not because you deserve to live in authenticity alone, but because you deserve to know what it feels like to be loved and to love others incredibly well. I can talk about this for days, but I'll end it there. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair. Yours and I will tell you mine. Meantime, the world goes on. Meantime, the sun and the clear pebbles of rain are moving across the landscapes, over the mountains, the valleys, the rivers, and the deep trees. Meantime, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are headed home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination. 
It calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over, announcing your place, 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 my place in the family of things. That's Mary Oliver. Thank you. It's been marvelous talking with the three of you and so happy that everybody gets to know a little bit better the people that we've chosen quite ably to lead us as we move forward at QCF. Thank you. <laughs>